online. And as you can see, they are here joining me uh, to have this conversation and give us their thoughts and reflections on the same. First up, I'd like us all, ladies and gentlemen, to hear from His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, who is the eighth UN Secretary General and also the chair of the Global Center on Adaptation. Your Excellency Ban Ki-moon, thank you for joining us. Please speak to us and give us your vision. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Okawara, for your very kind introduction. And uh, Your Excellency, President Uhura Kenyatta of Kenya, and thank you for your strong leadership and commitment uh, to uh, lead not only your country, Kenya, but also Africa, with a strong commitment to fight against the climate change. And I'd like to also uh, commend the leadership of uh, CEO Dr. Patrick Faircoyen for his um, very inspiring speech and strong commitment for his leadership. And I'm also uh, very happy to be uh, with uh, the leaders of um, uh, World Bank uh, and IMF and also uh, African Development Bank, World Trading uh, Organizations and also UNFCCC and I'm very happy to work with all these global leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Back in 2007, that was the first year as the Secretary General. I was the first Secretary General of the United Nations to visit Antarctica. In a small plane, I flew over melting ice fields. I could see vast chunks of ice the size of six-story buildings breaking away from ice shelves. Then I continued to visit the Arctic four times. The power of nature was impressive and extraordinarily beautiful. But the journey was deeply disturbing and because it was a proof climate change was accelerating faster than we thought. I had sent out strong, strongest possible messages to the people of the world, and particularly leaders of the world, that climate change was happening much, much faster than we have thought. And here I am, 14 years later, and what is happening now is worse than I could have ever imagined, particularly for those living on the front lines on the African continent. And we have no one but ourselves to blame. The recent IPCC report affirms that again, the human influence is to blame and some forms of climate disruption have now been locked in for centuries. We have no choice but to act and adapt, act to cut carbon emissions as fast as we can to reduce the burden on adaptation and adapt to growing climate impact that we have been experienced the world over, to secure people's lives and livelihoods, to secure a climate resilient future for everyone. We have just less than a week to go until COP26 in Glasgow. The time for talk is over and truly over. We have to deliver on the promises of Paris climate change agreement where we are failing. This means, first, there must be delivery of $100 billion in climate finance, as Dr. Fair Cohen has just mentioned for every year from 2020 until 2025 at least, with a parity between mitigation and adaptation. If there is to be any confidence and trust in global cooperation to address the climate emergency, I'm urging that there should be 50 to 50% allocations of financial support for mitigation and adaptation. Second, we must have every country aligning 
their admission abroad towards 1.5 degrees, a limit beyond which we cannot allow the Earth to go. Three, we must bring adaptation to climate change onto a level footing with emission cuts. The climate emergency is already all around us and no one is safe. COVID-19 has taught us that we are only as strong as our weakest link. That is why international efforts must be global. Everyone, every nation, every boardroom, every courthouse, every dinner table, every schoolyard can and must contribute to the solution. It is nothing short of the biggest challenge of our time, but we can do it. Adaptation will take on many shapes and forms all over this globe. As a new international organization, the Global Center on Adaptation, GCA, with Dr. Patrick Fercoyen at its helm, is a key resource for adapting our world. The state and trends in adaptation 2021 Africa report published by the GCA is the most comprehensive adaptation report on Africa where adaptation is most needed. This report does not just present a gloomy picture of the future, but it identifies opportunities to invest in adaptation across all key economic sectors, as well as the positive returns on such investment to speed up the achievement of the SDGs in Africa. The Africa-led and Africa-owned Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, AAAP, jointly developed by the GCA and the African Development Bank, is an opportunity to realize this ambition, delivering a resilient and prosperous future for Africa, as called for by all African leaders. The AAAP, as Africa's plan, seeks to mobilize $25 billion in five years to deliver action on four bold ideas that will upscale and accelerate adaptation on the front. First, digital agriculture resilient. Second, resilient infrastructure. Third, youth employment and entrepreneurship. And fourth, innovative finance. And of course, $25 billion over five years is a drop in the ocean compared to the challenges Africa faces, but it is the floor, not the ceiling for adaptation finance. The African Development Bank has already committed $12.5 billion of this money. Our goal is to raise the remaining $12.5 billion as a new and additional finance between now and COP27 split midway. As called by, by President Chisekedi of Democratic Republic of Congo, in his capacity as African Union leader, all partners need to come to Glasgow to commit to AAAP as its aims are realistic, necessary, and achievable. This is Africa's ask. This is Africa's imperative. Now the international community must respond to that. Therefore, to support the African continent in its transition towards a green, resilient recovery, I call on all leaders and development partners to capitalize AAAP upstream financing facility with 250 million euros over five years at COP26 next week in Glasgow. These resources are essential to unlock the billions of, to shift the trillions on the continent. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I also strongly support the leadership of African Development Bank to establish AAAP investment facility to finance the scale up and acceleration of adaptation on the African continent. The facility will be key vehicle to channel part of the $100 billion annually meant for adaptation and resilience building in Africa in the years to come. Here today, I would like to emphasize that we are starting a new chapter for Africa, an opportunity for the continent to build forward better and build greener. But for Africa to turn its plan into reality, Glasgow has to deliver on adaptation for the continent. Only together can we thrive and prosper. Thank you very much for your leadership and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, for your remarks. And indeed, for just reminding us that the time for talk is over and it is truly over. And for also just reiterating what we heard from uh, Professor Fakoyan um, telling us about that this is not just about painting a gloomy picture, but it's also about identifying the opportunities that exist for Africa when it comes to adaptation. And some very good things we're hearing as we head towards COP26 in Glasgow in the next few days. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, please allow me to introduce our next global leader to speak to us today, and that is the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kristalina Georgieva. Thank you so very much for including me in today's discussion. Uh, President Kenyatta, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, excellencies, colleagues and dear, dear friends. I want to start by first recognizing that we are very fortunate to gather on the birthday of President Kenyatta, so very many happy returns uh, on this day. Uh, and uh, to uh, recognize that uh, Kenya has stepped forward in this crisis uh, in a way that provides uh, more security to its people uh, but also lessons for others. Uh, our discussion is centered on a critical topic for Africa, adaptation to climate change. The Global Center for um, Adaptation uh, and, and the partners uh, they have are right to focus on Africa's adaptation as we approach COP26. Why? Because we all know it, climate change puts at risk Africa's substantial economic and development progress over the past decade, as the continent faces a market increase in the frequency and intensity of natural disasters, higher temperatures, and of course, for coastal Africa, rising sea levels. This is particularly concerning at the time when the COVID pandemic has already had a severe economic impact, job losses, reduced income for so many, debt levels up, uneven access to vaccines, reduced fiscal space that threatens to hold back the recovery. And we know that for Africa, climate shocks are particularly troubling because resilience to shocks remains low. Coping mechanisms in so many places are weak. So growth, jobs, food security are threatened, especially where people depend on rain-fed agriculture. As today's uh, 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 report rightly says, for Africa, climate adaptation is a necessity. It is not a choice. And adapting to climate change must go hand in hand with reducing poverty improving livelihoods, raising living standards. From our perspective, there are three priorities for action, and they are priorities that press urgency on us to act. First, we must strengthen ex-ante resilience to climate shocks. 
It means investing in climate smart agriculture, resilient infrastructure, boosting food security with better irrigation systems to reduce reliance on rainfall, better access to agricultural research and climate resilient seeds, better roads and storage combined with trade reforms that promote commerce and get products to market in good time, including across borders. This also means investing in resilient people through adequate access to vaccinations right now and in the future, through good health care, but also through investing in education and technology. So Africa can have accurate weather forecasts in the hands of farmers. So farmers productivity and the quality and speed of food distribution all improve. Broader access to finance can help households invest in their own resilience efforts. Second priority, strong preparedness, strong coping mechanisms to attenuate the impact of climate events. Uh, we have seen the value of social assistance, such as cash transfers, access to finance. They act as buffer when a disaster strikes helping people, businesses, and communities to cope. Uh, and, and that was very visible over the last uh, year. We saw how cash and in-kind transfers provided households and workers essential goods, and how digital technology helped people receive money quickly. And that brings me to my third priority. We need to urgently unlock climate financing for adaptation. We at the IMF estimate that at least two to three percent of regional GDP, this is 30 to 50 billion dollars, is needed each year over the next decade to accelerate adaptation efforts in sub Saharan Africa. Countries need to do their part by mobilizing revenues, improving spending efficiency, but that is not going to be enough. They need external support to cover the bulk of the financing needs. The international community ought to deliver on its annual commitment to provide $100 billion per year in climate finance to developing countries. And within this $100 billion, we ought to prioritize uh, for sub-Saharan Africa investment in adaptation. We also need greater financing by the private sector. The IMF on the house side are doing our part at this critical moment in human history. We are putting climate at the heart of our work. Uh, to leverage the recently uh, uh, allocated $650 billion, $50 billion uh, special drawing rights, we are in the process of develop developing a new resilience and sustainability trust to help low and vulnerable middle income countries make important reforms, including increasing climate resilience. We have days to COP26 in Glasgow. We all know it is a historic opportunity for the world to recognize that past inaction has made adaptation a necessity. And armed with this knowledge, we must urgently move towards stopping the dangerous accumulation of CO2 emissions and avoid an even worse situation. Put simply, the more mitigation we do, the less adaptation we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gergieva, Gergieva um, and for your leadership in making climate central to the work of the IMF. We appreciate your time and your insights um, and for the work that you are doing in this space. Now, you have heard of the work that has happened um, towards the AAAP, and that is together with the GCA. It's now time for us to hear from uh, our next leader, who is the president of the African Development Bank Group, His Excellency Dr. Akinmumi Adeshina, who is the president, once again, of the AFDB. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Please speak to us. Your Excellencies, 
with only a few days to go until the world comes together in Glasgow for COP26, there couldn't be a better moment to present Africa's climate needs to the world. A year ago, the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank joined forces and launched the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program called AAAP. We are mobilizing $25 billion to scale up climate change adaptation actions and drive investments in green growth. Because the time for action is now. AAAP is built on four pillars. First, agriculture. We will scale up access to climate smart digital technologies and associated data driven agricultural and financial services to at least 30 million farmers in Africa. Second, infrastructure. We will ensure that climate risk and resilience are integrated in at least 50% of total value of new infrastructure investments in Africa across all infrastructure sectors. Third, youth. We will promote sustainable job creation through entrepreneurship in climate adaptation and resilience by unlocking $3 billion in credit for adaptation action. Fourth, innovative financial initiatives. We will increase financial flows for adaptation and resilience with a total increase of adaptation finance on the continent to over $5 billion per year by 2025. We say, we do, we deliver. Ladies and gentlemen, $25 billion may seem like a lot of money, but it's actually not enough to meet Africa's adaptation needs, which are estimated to be $7 billion to $15 billion per year. The AAAP provides a unique opportunity for wealthier nations to meet their commitments and help Africa to tackle the consequences of climate change. I am optimistic that our partners will deliver the first round of financing of $6 billion to $8 billion that we need for the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program in 2021. I call upon you to support the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank in our efforts to unlock more essential funding for adaptation. Several years ago, the world's wealthier nations pledged to mobilize $100 billion a year by 2020 to help developing countries cope with the effects of climate change. It's time to finally deliver on that promise. Our continent, the least contributor to global emissions, cannot and should not bear the burden of climate change alone. Now we are all in this together. Together we can, and we must collectively mobilize the resources. Together we will overcome the monumental challenges ahead of us. Together with visionary leadership, we will find our ways towards a climate resilient future. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for speaking to us on that one. And indeed, um, $25 billion may seem like a lot of money. It is not, and that is why we're looking towards more commitment and our eyes and the eyes of the world trained to Glasgow. COP26 in the next few days. And that is where I want us to go so that we can listen to our next leader here on our program this afternoon or this morning, wherever you could be joining us from around the world. It is to Glasgow we go, and it is to speak to the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, Your Excellency Patricia Espinoza. Your Excellency, please speak to us all the way from Glasgow. That's correct. Greetings from Glasgow. It's really a pleasure to participate in this very important day for adaptation and accelerating the pace of resilience building in Africa. I want to um, uh, greet uh, President Kenyatta, also to take advantage of this opportunity to wish him all the best for his birthday and in the coming years uh, to come. 
I'm particularly honored and humbled to be able to join this uh, amazing group of uh, world leaders, um, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, um, uh, my dear friend, Kristalina uh, uh, Georgieva from the IMF, uh, um, the uh, President Adesina from the African Development Bank, and of course, um, uh, Dr. Patrick Verhoegen, uh, who is really behind uh, making all of this possible. So thank you all for your leadership and commitment, because we need all the efforts in order to make the COP26 here in Glasgow a success. So this year's focus on your side, on Africa, provides the most comprehensive overview of the present and projected climate risks to date. It also provides an excellent blueprint for adaptation actions for the African continent in the face of climate change. And this work is coming at a key moment as the speakers before me have already underlined, because we are just days away from COP26. Actually, I am already here in Glasgow waiting for all of you. And success here is crucial. Nations here at COP26 must bridge existing differences, complete their outstanding agenda, work towards fully implementing the Paris Agreement, and continue to build climate action. Adaptation is key to the delivery of a successful COP26, and there are several areas of focus. The Paris Agreement provides the globally agreed framework for the fight against climate change. And it is important that all efforts are aligned to support that framework. National adaptation plans are key instruments under the Paris Agreement, and those plans are the main international instrument for adaptation planning and implementation. We need nations to consolidate and strengthen those plans. COP26 is their opportunity to do it. So far, only 26 NAPs have been formulated. However, the good news is that at least 125 out of 154 developing countries have already initiated work on their national adaptation plans and the Green Climate Fund is already actively supporting that work. But much more needs to be done. That's where the momentum on adaptation is with the national adaptation plans. And that's where international support for adaptation should be. Most of the least developed countries are in Africa. So advancing support to Africa on national adaptation plans will be a huge contribution to global efforts supporting adaptation. Now is the time for focus. Now is the time for unity of purpose. We all need to boost communications around adaptation, resilience, and what that means with respect to the impacts of climate change. This subject, especially with respect to recent climate emergencies, will only grow in importance. In that vein, National Climate Action Plans, or NDCs, are also an opportunity to inform the international community about the vision and goals identified in national adaptation plans. We encourage all nations to complete both their NAPs and to submit robust and ambitious NDCs as rapidly as possible. Key to success in adaptation and resilience like so many other issues related to climate change. And this has also been already underlined by uh, all the speakers that have preceded me, is adequate finance. For COP26, we have been calling for wider ranging and comprehensive financial support for developing nations. Just yesterday, the COP26 presidency released the 100 billion delivery plan led by Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Jonathan Wilkinson, and Germany's State Secretary at the Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety of Germany, Jochen Flassbach. 
According to this plan, the outlook to 2025 shows progress towards 2022 and provides confidence that the 100 billion goal will be met from 2023. We cannot understate it. Without the necessary support, we will not be able to embark in the transformations needed to achieve the 1.5 degree goal. And this is not only about the 100 billion. We need to mobilize the trillions. We will continue to call for balance of the total share of public climate finance provided by all developed countries and multilateral development banks to be allocated to adaptation and resilience. It's important to note that Africa is a global leader with respect to adaptation financing. We have just heard President Adesina how much he is working together with his team in putting the plans together in making a clear projection of what are the needs of Africa. So I really hope that the support for um, the African Development Bank will be forthcoming and that the, all the other international financial institutions will also follow this example. Uh, what is happening now under President Adesina's leadership is a good beginning. The kind of leadership we need to see globally. I want to also recognize the leadership by Kristalina uh, Georgieva at the head of the IMF and uh, recognize the way that he ha she has been promoting this agenda within the finance community, which is not an easy task. So thank you very much also to Kristalina for all your leadership and uh, your uh, uh, drive. This leadership must reflect why adaptation must be discussed with the same urgency as mitigation, as the impacts of extreme weather become more and more evident and nowhere more so than in Africa, this is no longer an issue up for debate. The climate emergency is here and we need solutions now. Dear colleagues, excellencies, the next weeks will be critical for the success of our collective climate change efforts in Africa and throughout the world with respect to adaptation, finance, and mitigation. Your input and in this report is vital to that success. I can assure you not only of UN climate change's ongoing support, but that I will bring forth this information to leaders here in Glasgow. I once again thank you for this incredibly important work, for your leadership, and I would like to count on your support uh, here in Glasgow. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Espinoza, and for your personal um, you know, commitment to that as well. And I'm sure the world looks forward to meeting you in Glasgow in the next few days. Thank you very much um, for your role in this. And now we want to hear from a strong African voice that joins us now, leading uh, the World Trade Organization as Director General. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala to speak to us from the World Trade Organization. Madam? Well, th thank you so much uh, for, for having me and on this very important occasion. I really want to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Verwian and uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta for the launch of this, and His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. It's a fantastic event, a fantastic day. I also want to congratulate my brother, Dr. Akin Adeshina, for the way that he has taken on this challenge and put forward the resources or part of the resources needed to make this a reality. I, today, I'd like to make uh, four, four points. On, on trade and climate. But the, the first one is really that um, we, we should think adaptation and we must prioritize it in our response to the climate emergency. Last month, the scientific community confirmed what most of us already know, climate change is here. 
It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land, and that global surface temperatures will continue to increase until at least the mid-century. Global efforts to address the climate emergency must equally focus on climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Indeed, failure to adapt to climate change and build resilience will lead to a devastating loss of life and livelihoods around the world, worse than what we have seen in this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that Patrick laid it out very clearly what this will mean for Africa. We must therefore mainstream climate adaptation and resilience into every sector and every decision we make. Let me again congratulate the Global Center for Adaptation for its significant contribution to accelerate action and support for adaptation solutions. The World Trade Organization looks forward to working closely with you at the GCA, with governments and other partners to support these objectives. I was very pleased that the WTO Secretariat for the first time has contributed a chapter on trade to the State and Trends in Adaptation in Africa Report 2020. This, I hope, is just the start of the collaboration between the WTO and the Global Center for Adaptation. Adaptation to climate change must be a priority for every government, every organization, and, and putting in place the relevant policy frameworks, including for trade, uh, to reflect all of this. The WTO can make a significant contribution uh, to, to, to the climate agenda in three areas that will be crucial to buttress our climate adaptation efforts at the upcoming COP26 and beyond. The first is ensuring that supply chains are resilient, and this should be a key component of countries' adaptation strategies. International trade and supply chains are an insurance policy against climate risks and must form part of national adaptation strategies. Open trade is indispensable to cushion against and adapt to the negative impacts of climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that global supply chains are a source of strength, not weakness. However, supply chains are also vulnerable to disruption as we see. It is therefore imperative that we make global supply chains as resilient as possible so we can withstand the changes in our climate system. Making supply chains resilient will require global effort to climate-proof transport and other key trade-related infrastructure. To cope with heat and humidity extremes, multiple locations around the world, including in Africa, will require substantial investment in transport, as well as energy and communications infrastructure. The same can be said about seaports coping with rising sea levels. The WTO-led Aid for Trade initiative can help mobilize investment in climate resilient infrastructure. Aid for trade to build energy, transport, and telecommunications infrastructure amounted to $25 billion in 2019, representing 55% of overall aid for trade disbursements. This is an opportunity we must seize for building resilience. Strengthening regional integration and supply chains for further bolsters against climate risks through economic diversification. Putting all our eggs in one basket is not a recipe for agility or resilience. Investment in regional value chains and regional trade provides opportunities to diversify trade, share tasks, and manage adaptation challenges. For instance, as climate change causes crop yields to fall, open and reliable agricultural trade will be crucial for hunger-affected and import-dependent regions, such as certain parts of the continent. There is therefore an opportunity to achieve the twin goals of economic integration and climate resilience through investment in climate-proof transport and connectivity infrastructure. My second point is that climate adaptation plans need to rely on trade liberalization to ensure that every climate finance dollar goes further. The WTO can help lower barriers to trade for goods, services, and technologies that are essential for adaptation. Lowering trade barriers helps to stretch each dollar of adaptation finance further. This makes it more affordable to invest in cutting edge technologies for addressing risks from sea level rise, drought, 
extreme weather events and floods or for climate proofing infrastructure. In a similar way during the pandemic, we have seen WTO members streamline their trade policies to speed up access to essential medical supplies like vaccines. If we focus on Africa, eliminating barriers to trade in adaptation goods and services would significantly reduce the costs of meeting the continent's adaptation priorities. To give an example, import tariffs levied on goods relevant to adaptation, we have an illustrative list of 56 of these goods, average close to 10% in many African countries, with tariffs sometimes going as high as 50% in some countries. In terms of Africa's energy security, 70% of Africa's energy is generated through hydropower, which is exposed to significant climate risks. Meanwhile, the whole of Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, my country, has an installed capacity uh, for, for uh, electricity uh, that is... Uh, almost equivalent to, to what we have at uh, London Heathrow. Thus, trade opening must be used as part of the solution for diversifying and enhancing low carbon energy supply in Africa. My third point is that international cooperation must be intensified to ensure that climate adaptation efforts are effective and widespread, and the WTO stands ready to contribute to this objective. Governments across the world must join forces with all the relevant stakeholders, including the private sector and civil society, to put in place comprehensive adaptation strategies. In this context, we should ensure that trade policies are fully aligned with climate adaptation strategies. Trade and the WTO have a key role to play here in delivering affordable and accessible climate adaptation solutions. Indeed, the WTO promotes stable and predictable global trade to speed up dissemination of adaptation technologies. WTO monitors and enhances transparency of supply chains, which facilitates trade and investment and enables the smooth flow of needed goods and services. We can use the WTO's Aid for Trade initiative to marshal investments in climate resilient infrastructure. We meet at a crossroads for climate change and trade. COP26 and the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference will both take place in the coming weeks. COP26 is an opportunity to make great strides in building global adaptation capacity. The blueprint for adaptation actions for the African continent set out in this report is vitally important and trade and the WTO can help realize these goals. We look forward to working with you. In turn, at the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference, WTO members are working on various initiatives to promote the role of trade in addressing climate change and other environmental challenges. Both venues will allow us to make trade a force for climate adaptation. The WTO stands ready to continue serving the international community in the fight against climate change. Thank you, and uh, it's been an honor to join you. Thank you. It has indeed been an honor for us to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Iweala, and thank you as well to our global leaders. We cannot thank you enough for your time here and the commitments that you are making towards accelerated adaptation for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, it is now time for our global press conference uh, that we're having here. And at this point, I'd like to invite uh, back on stage for this uh, Dr. Patrick Vakoyan uh, to come up here and uh, answer some of the questions. We have our members of the press who are here, um, some of them colleagues of mine, um, and I'm looking forward to the questions um, that they will have for you. So um, let's move into that now. And um, just to let you know how this will go, um, we would like you to uh, step up to the aisle. We have our hostesses who will be here.